Good evening, sisters. I am so excited to be here tonight. I'm so excited to see your faces all the more. And I just want to reiterate what Sarah said, Kim, Lisa, Judy, wherever you are. I don't have my contacts on today, but we're going to miss you guys so much. You guys have been incredible pillars, pillars in Southland for so many years. And the impact that you've had on all of our hearts, it's, it's beyond the time that I've actually known you. Let's just say that. And so I just want to appreciate just the ways that you guys have laid your lives down for God. And I'm just so excited to see what God does with you all in Dallas. And so I have an incredible story to share with you all today. It really inspired me this week, and I pray that it can do the same to you. So in 1818, Dr. Ignaz Philip Simoways, Simoways, he's Hungarian. <laughs> okay. He was born into the world, into a world of dying women. Even the finest hospitals, one out of every six women was dying due to childbed fever. And so what was happening is these physicians were starting their days doing autopsies. And then they would travel throughout the hospital without washing their hands. And then they would go and treat expectant mothers. And so very early on, he was able to track the increasing deaths due to the, the hygienic issue that was going on. And so after 11 years of delivering babies, he delivered over 8,500 babies, and he only lost 184 mothers, which was incredible compared to the statistic. And so then he spent most of his life learning and debating with his colleagues, trying to help them to wash their hands. Something super simple for us, right? But it was very different back then. And he tells them, I've shown you how this can be prevented. I've proved it with all that I've said. But while we talk, 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 gentlemen, women are dying. I'm not asking you for something world changing. I'm just asking that you simply wash, wash your hands. To no avail. At the age of 47, he dies from insanity trying to convince his colleagues to do something different. And so here are his wash basins tossed to the side, his colleagues laughing in his face to the cries of thousands of mothers who are dying that could be helped. And so we didn't come to midweek to learn about hygiene or the importance of washing our hands. But I do have another question for you all today, ladies. How often do you wash your heart? Throughout the day, our hearts are collecting dirt from the things that we see, the things that we hear, the things that we do that is different from the will of God, that doesn't please the will of God. And so going on about our lives without stopping to clean our hearts from these things will harm us spiritually. And if we turn to Psalm 51, verse 10, we see David's plea as he understands the need for a pure heart. So please turn with me to Psalm 51, verse 10. In Psalm 51, verse 10, give me an amen when you're there. Okay, we're still turning, I can tell. All right, Psalm 51, verse 10, the Bible reads, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Such a simple verse, but so incredibly powerful. David is crying out to God and he's asking, can you please create a pure heart in me? He knew that he was not able to do it on his own. And he asked God to renew the spirit that's within him that was given to him by God. And we know a little bit of the context of this story. It was right after he'd committed adultery with Bathsheba. He was not in a good place with God. 
And yet, because he knew the God he was praying to, how generous, how amazing, how gracious he was, he pleaded with God, can you change my heart? Can you give me something new? And it can be created by our creator. And it can be renewed because God is a God of renewal. And so tonight, ladies, regardless of where your heart has been this week, this year, the past 10 years, the past 50 years, I want to inspire you with the sermon today that God can create a pure heart in you. And the only topic that we're going to be talking about tonight is prayer. And so with that, I want to give you the title of my sermon, Wash Your Heart. And so the reason why these doctors didn't wash their hands was because they didn't believe. They didn't believe that it would actually change anything. And for us, that can sometimes be what holds us back from praying. We don't believe that God will change anything. And so that disbelief led to death. It led to insanity, but it hurt so many families. What is our lack of prayer causing? When we don't wash our hearts, it'll hurt the women that we're leading. We're leading from a place of frustration and anger and wanting to control and to fix as opposed to just love. We're hurting our families. How many of us are in homes where there's the silent treatment being given, you know, or numbing out or people not even wanting to come home? It's hurting our friendships. It's hurting ourselves. We're holding grudges in our hearts, bitterness that's tearing away from us being able to experience the full joy that God has for us. But it's most importantly hurting our God. In Ephesians 6, verse 10, the Bible talks about how this is a very spiritual world and we're fighting a very spiritual war, which means we can't use weapons of this world to fight off spiritual things. And in verse 18, in Ephesians 6, in verse 18, give me an amen when you're there. Amen. 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 In Ephesians 6, verse 18, the Bible says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And so what is God's solution to us on how to fight this spiritual battle? Prayer. Which is insane. I mean, we knew that. But how could it be so powerful? And he specifically mentions that we have to pray on all occasions, so happy times, sad times, confusing times, with all kinds of prayers. I didn't know that there were many types of prayers. I prayed for my food. My dad would um, pray with us every single night. Um, I was sharing this story with uh, Jenna earlier today, how he would come into each of our rooms, and I'm the oldest of six, so it's quite a bit of prayers that he had to pray. But he's a faithful man of God, you know? Or he loved, loved God. And so, anyways, he's praying with us in Creole, and then we always end in French, and I don't speak French. And so I knew prayer through repetition. And then my mom taught me how to pray for long hair, and I prayed for that because I really wanted long hair, you know? And so oftentimes the prayers that we pray are prayers that have been taught to us. But it says all kinds of prayers. And so it made me curious, what other kinds of prayers are out there? And so that led me on a search of defining what prayer means. And so I want to share some of my findings with you. And please be kinder to me than they were to Dr. Simowise. Simowise. So in the Greek, the word pray is prosukomai. Say it with me, prosukomai. Yeah, I don't want to be the only silly one up here saying this. And so pros means to be toward or facing, meaning you're praying and seeking God's face. And yukomai means to speak out, to express a wish, to pray, to vow, speaking consciously with or without vocalization. 
Has anyone ever prayed in bed, but you didn't count it? Because like, when were you actually praying and when did you fall asleep? Like, it was blurred lines. And so we don't always have to pray out loud, but it says we can pray consciously. And so prosukamai, that kind of prayer, it encompasses all aspects of prayer. So I'm going to break it down. Submission, confession, petition, supplication, intercession, praise, and thanksgiving. And so with submission, it's to exchange your will for God's. Like going into your prayer, God, this is what I want. This is what I want you to make happen. But then through that process of just sharing your heart with God, he's able to expose your motives. He's able to help you to see his heart behind why he's allowing things to happen, to allow you to surrender, to see how his will and his plan is so much better for you than your own. Then he goes into confession. And so confession is being able to share with God all the thoughts, the feelings, the good, the bad, the ugly, knowing that it's a judgment-free zone. Think of that friend where you can just lay down your hair and just tell her everything like it is. And having that with God. Petition. And so petition is one that really challenges me because it's over and over and over and over and over praying for the same thing. And yet sometimes why we don't do petitioning is because we're like, God doesn't care. He doesn't hear us. And a lot of that might stem from our childhoods or people who have hurt us, who didn't hear us after we asked time and time again. So now we attribute that to God when really he's seeing, are we still going to have faith? Are we still going to trust him? Supplication is concerning your own needs. So God, this is what I want. This is what I need. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray in Luke 11, he says to pray for your daily bread. So meaning they came back the next day praying for their daily bread again. And the next day praying for their daily bread again. We have to pray every single day. I mean, it's a spiritual battle. How do we think we're going to be able to last one day without God? Or one day without his protection? It just doesn't make sense. But it makes sense why Jesus woke up early in the morning to go pray. Because he didn't want to walk out naked into this crazy world to be attacked from all sides. And even for us, sisters, we have to wake up early to pray. Early to share our needs with God. Early to petition to God so that we can be protected by him. The next one is intercession. Now, this one is concerning the needs of others. Right? It's praying for our families, for our friends, our coworkers, the people that we're walking by. This world is hurting. There's mental health that's deteriorating. The more influences and exposure that happens through the media and just everything, everywhere. People are depressed. And it's, it's, it's a, a result of so many different factors. But God says we can pray for other people. And that can help them to heal. There have been times where I've been so low spiritually that I know that the reason I got out of it was because a sister was praying for me. There's just no way. And so being able to pray, to be, to be um, battle buddies, fighting for our sisters and their relationship with God as well. Praise, being able to sing with songs of worship. You know, starting off our prayers with singing. When was the last time we did something like that? I know all the song leaders probably do. You know, I do it too, even though you guys won't let me be a song leader, but just letting you know I practice and I audition with God, okay? And then it says with thanksgiving, being able to pray prayers of gratitude. Now, we won't turn there, but in Philippians 4, verses 6 through 8, you can go ahead and write that down. The Bible teaches us not to be anxious about anything, but that we can pray about everything, in every situation, and God will provide peace that transcends understanding to God our hearts and our minds. And so what that means is after we pray, we'll feel peaceful, even though our situation might not have changed. 
It's a peace that doesn't make sense, transcends all understanding. That's a pretty way of saying it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense why we feel rejuvenated and re-engaged to be able to go back out again. But one interesting component of that scripture says to pray with thanksgiving. Sometimes we'll lay down all of our anxieties, we'll lay down all the problems, we'll lay down all the issues, and that's where we end our prayer. Okay, amen, got to go back to work. But he says, in with gratitude. Search to see the ways that God might have already been answering that prayer. Or thank him for why he's allowing you in this situation. Sometimes where I can't find any bright side, I thank God that the trial moves me to pray to him. Because otherwise I probably wouldn't have. And even that, prayer is really just about connecting with God. Having an intimate relationship with God. Imagine if God only helped you so you could worship him. And yet he helps you because he loves you. And so even when we pray, it's not just, God, I need this. And if you don't do this, I'm not going to pray to you anymore. It's, God, I just want to talk to you. I just want to be in your presence. I can talk to my friends, but it's not the same. Prosukome. Prosukome. And I just appreciate this because, oh, I didn't tell you my point. This will probably make a little bit more sense. Let me tell you now. Prayer prevents malpractice. (laughs) So now that we've defined what prayer is, why would it produce or why could it lead to malpractice or how could it lead to death? Well, I was reading this week, I started The Power of a Praying Wife. Has anyone ever read it? Okay, yeah, yeah. The Power of a Praying Wife. It's, it's pretty good. I got it last year. Um, one of my friends gave it to me before I got married. And it was one of those books I left on my shelf because I like challenging books and I thought it was going to be fluffy. I did not know what I was in for. And as I'm reading it, one of the earlier pages, it says... God easily uncovers attitudes and habits outside his perfect will and requires we don't sin in our hearts because sin separates us from God and we don't get our prayers answered. And so it says that when we pray, God shows us what's really underlying the things that we're asking for and he requires that we don't sin, that we're actually pure in our intentions. And if not, our prayers don't get answered. And so I read this and I was challenged by it. And I was just like, I don't know if I believe that. But then she said to turn to Psalm 66. Let's turn to Psalm 66, verse 18. And this helped me to have a greater conviction. Psalm 66, verse 18. Tell me amen when you guys get there. Wow, you guys are fast. Psalm 66, verse 18. The Bible reads, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and has heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. Isn't that insane? Isn't that amazing? The scripture reads, if we had cherished it, if we had coveted it, loved it in our hearts, God would not have listened. God cannot be with sin. And yet God has surely listened, meaning that he must have had to work through the sin in his heart. And it makes sense why in Mark 11, verse 25, you can write it down. It says, if you stand praying and you realize you have not forgiven your brother or your sister to go back and to forgive them. Because how can you expect grace and mercy if you're unwilling to show grace and mercy? That's like saying what was done to you was more painful or more wicked than what you did to Jesus. And yet Jesus was sinless, perfect, blameless, right? 
And so sometimes we're praying and we're like, God, this person's laziness, like, please just give them a spirit of discipline. Like, God, this person's so irresponsible, God. Show them, God, convict them in their hearts. God, this person was so disrespectful. Do they know who I am? God, I pray that they can have a greater respect for the people around them. God, that sister's pride. Oh, God, I know you oppose the pride, the proud. Lord, be gentle with them if you want. You don't have to. And we're praying like that. And yet God is like, and so is your unforgiveness. So is your self-pity. So is your bitterness, your fear, your faithlessness, your annoyance, your insecurity. Fun fact, though, insecurity is not in the Bible. Do you know what word it is? So is your pride. When we can't forgive and we're harboring all these evil, wicked thoughts towards other people, it's our own pride getting in our way. And he's saying if you cherish it. If you feel entitled to it, if you get annoyed when someone shows you a scripture to deal with it before that person is dealt with, God won't listen. God won't listen. It's malpractice. It's improper and it's negligent. You're not doing your own hard work and you're expecting someone else to do theirs right and some of us that's where we are tonight right whether it's towards our husbands whether it's towards our husbands towards our friends our discipler our leader why does she do that I'm never gonna trust her again she has to win my trust back whether it's towards our child how dare she talk to me like that after all I've done whether it's towards our interests, he didn't say hi to me today. Do I no longer exist? Or the sister that talked to your interests? Who does she think she is? I said dibs. But maybe it's towards God. God, you're not hearing me. Why am I here? I don't deserve to be here. After all I've done for you, as though God hasn't done way more. And so God is asking us to deal with the sin in our hearts so that we don't commit malpractice. Point number two, prayer saves lives. And so we're going to talk about how prayer saves lives. We're going to go to Psalm 62. We're going to stay in the Psalms. You guys are so sweet. (laughs) Psalm 62, verse 5. The Bible reads, are we there? Amen? Okay, you guys are getting loud. I love it. Psalm 62, verse 5. The Bible reads, yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Wow. My soul find rest in God. Has anyone felt tired this week? Oh, wow, everyone, right? Exhausted, empty, depleted. Have we believed that we'll find rest in God? It says that's where your soul finds rest. So prayer is a place of resting. It's not I'm too tired to pray. I'm too tired, so I must pray. My hope comes from him. Have we felt hopeless about any goals that we set for the year? We're scared to revisit that we set in January 1. You know, maybe some of our gym goals. Maybe some of our reading goals. You know, maybe we're neglecting calling our families like we said we would. It says our hope comes from God. God can renew that. 
He's my rock, my salvation, my fortress. When you're praying, pray knowing who you're praying to and what he can do, the power that he has. He says, my salvation and my honor depend on God. You know, once saved is not always saved, right? We have to work at our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it depends on God. And God is rooting for us, right? He wants us to get to heaven, but we have to be urgent, right? Many of you are studying the Bible, right? You're getting to know God or deepening your relationship with God. And I want to encourage you to be urgent. The day of salvation is today. We might not get tomorrow. We might not get time to be perfect. We will never have time to be perfect, right? But we don't need to be perfect, right? God just wants us to be willing he wants us to know him, to have a deep love for him, to be willing to seek him with our whole hearts, and to know that our salvation depends on him. He believes that he can use us right now. My mighty rock, my refuge, and to trust in him at all times. But I want to focus on the section where it says, and pour out your hearts to him. So how can prayer save our lives? It's when we pour everything out and God's able to replace it and fill us up with him. And so my freshman year at Columbia, back in New York City, this is about, what, 2019, 2016? One of the years. And so that, they're very spread apart, but it's one of those years. I got my first waitressing job. And it was in Times Square. And has anyone ever gone to New York City, Times Square? It's crazy. There's people everywhere. I loved it. I felt like I was thriving. But I'm working at Planet Hollywood, and it's busy. And it's a lot of international clientele. And so one of the things that they teach us, and I was sharing this story with Mama Pam and um, Kim this past Sunday, um, how to hold a tray with different types of drinks on it. And so in this particular day, I was holding a tray, just like this. And I had water glasses with ice on it, maybe like five or six. I had beer bottles on it, I don't know how many, wine glasses and milkshakes. And I was trying to be efficient and fast. I was focused on my tips, you know, I'm gonna make a good impression, I'm gonna get all their drinks in one go. Yeah. Yeah, you guys caught it before I caught it. And so I'm putting down the drinks at the different tables. I'm smiling, you know, hi guys, I'm Regine. I'm happy to serve you, yada, yada. And I make a mental note, okay, Regine, you're holding glasses of different capacities. Be careful how you tilt the tray because some will be able to stay and some will fall like a feather. So I, I, I told myself that. Right? And so I'm putting down the drinks, and I get to one of the waters, and I'm leaning over to put it across the table, and the milkshake drenches this woman in a white blouse. And it's an Oreo cookies and cream milkshake, and I like freak out. She's yelling in a different language. I'm yelling in English. My manager is coming. He's like, Virgin. I was like, do you want me to help? He's like, go to the back. And I rush to the back. I'm like, I lost my job today. I'm going to be poor for the rest of my life. How could I do this? I saw it and I still didn't stop it, but it poured out on her. And luckily they come to her meal. I pray if she's watching this that she forgives me if she hasn't. But it was so embarrassing, but there was nothing left. All of it was out. And that has to be our prayer lives, where we're pouring every single thing out to God, where we're drenched, maybe in sweat. Afterwards, you've not resisted to the point of shedding blood. Jesus poured himself out to the point of blood coming out of him. And that has to be our prayers. But sometimes we pray a little bit and then just take it all right back with us. We cast our anxiety a little bit onto God and then when we're ready to leave, we take it with us so that we can go and vent to this person and this person and this person about it. And so I understand that there's so many transitions that are happening. 
There are so many needs that are happening that are, that are being shown and gaps that need to be filled. But if we're not pouring ourselves out to God, we won't see how God can fill us up so that we can be the answer to those gaps. So that we can step up and we can be available to help another sister to pray. If we're not empty and we're full of anxiety and all these different things, we won't be of use either, right? I want to end with one last scripture in Romans 8. In Romans 8, verse 26. You guys with me? Romans 8, verse 26. Okay, amen. Let's see if we can all say it together. Amen. Come on, ladies. Romans 8, 26. The Bible reads, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And so the Bible teaches us here that the Spirit helps us when we're weak. So God doesn't leave us to figure out how to be unstuck in our prayer, but he sends us the Holy Spirit. And so in Acts 2, 38, the Bible tells us it's when we've repented and been baptized as a disciple that we get that spirit living in us. And it's to help us. Meaning that God knows we won't be able to do this on our own. And so what that means is prayer is where we get the power to live as disciples. And it says it helps us in our times of weakness. And sometimes we won't know what to pray for. There have been so many prayers where I start off and I'm like, God, please put on my heart what you want me to say. God, please reveal my heart to me. I know it's deceitful. God, tell me what you want me to know right now. Help me to walk out of this prayer resolved. Ask God to help you to pray. And it says that he'll search your heart and he'll intercede for you. So in the same way we get to intercede for other people, the spirit intercedes for us. God values us that much. And he's like, I know she don't know what's going on and she don't know why it's going on. So Holy Spirit, please communicate to her. Isn't that gracious? And it's all in accordance with the will of God. Meaning God is fighting tooth and nail to help us to make it to him one day. And so I didn't ask permission, but I want to lift her up. I hope it's okay. Joyce, you can tell me after if it's not okay. But I want to lift up Joyce. (laughs) And so many of us know Joyce. She's been coming around. She's Lynn's famous yoga buddy. And yoga is serious practice, okay? And this past week, we've been prayer partners. And it's been so incredibly faith-building to see the way that her life has transformed as she's talking to God. And I remember our first prayer time, I was going through a lot. It was really, I needed it, you know? And she just happened to be on the other end of the line. And I'm praying, and she's like, wow, you taught me a new word. You called God dad. I didn't know we could call him dad. That's how intimate we get to have a relationship with God, that he gets to be our dad. And after the second prayer call, she's like, I prayed last night, I prayed this morning, you wanna pray again, I'll pray for you, you know? And it's just been so incredible to see the way that the intimacy has grown in her relationship with God. And please pray for Joyce, I believe she can become our sister this week, okay? But prayer saves lives. It saves our lives. It allows us to minister better to the women that we're studying the Bible with. It allows us to discern what they need, right? Walking into a Bible study, not praying for the person. You're a nurse. God's the doctor. If you're not getting notes from the doctor, what are you about to do? What kind of surgery, what kind of spiritual surgery are you about to perform? Right? We have to pray through these things. 
and allow God to reveal things. And so I just want to end with that, right? I was so inspired by the story in the very beginning, wash your hands, but really for us sisters to wash our hearts. God wants to create a new spirit. It starts with our prayer lives. And this week, please find a prayer partner and just pour yourself out on the phone with them. Go on a prayer walk with them. If you have to turn your discipling time into a prayer time, do that. But get to know your sister's hearts. Know what really concerns them so that you can bring that up to God and you can pray on their behalf. It's the only way we're going to be able to fight this spiritual war. And so I pray that you learn something new about prayer tonight. But more than that, I pray that you are empowered to go and tap into all that God wants to do through you and what he wants to reveal to you in prayer. And to God be the glory. Mm